I titled Lesson 23, Christian Hope, even though the word hope isn't found in the passage. And there's a reason for that. It's from Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. It's just four verses. But again, these verses are so important and I think represent something that's often misunderstood in our churches. And so I wanted to take a little bit of time to emphasize this passage this week and put it in the context of the whole of scripture. So we're gonna talk about the hope Christians should have. As a reminder, last week, Paul talked about this continuing debt that all of us as Christians have, will never repay this debt. And that is our debt to love one another as Jesus has loved us. It is a debt that is unpayable. And so we need to live recognizing we live with that debt each day and make it a goal to keep trying to pay it back. It's a good, framework for our life. He said, loving one another is my command. Jesus didn't suggest we work hard to do our best. Jesus said and then repeated, this is a command. Why was that? Because love was the fulfillment of the law. Love is the way we accomplish everything else that we are called to do and who we are called to be in scripture. How important is it to love others? I hope in the days since we studied that lesson that God has brought that back to your mind several times and continues to do that. We have no higher goal this week's passage, today's passage begins, and do this. Do what? Love. That's why we needed to emphasize that again. Love, pay back that continual debt to love. Do that. Paul's gonna speak of the urgency of his day, his first century, church. And trust me, he had no idea how urgent it was. The time he said to live for Christ is right now. Remember when you were a teenager and you thought, well, maybe I'll wait and become a Christian later after I've had fun in college or something like that. I actually had people say that to me at times. The time to start living for Christ is right now, as soon as you know you should. The time to stop living for the world is right now. Because every choice we make that is apart from God's will for our life can impact the rest of our life. I don't need to give you examples of what I just said, but I will say it again. Every choice we make apart from the control and leadership of God in our life is a choice that can impact the rest of our life. God wants us to live for him right now. The time to be sanctified, which means to be made holy. The time to grow and live the holy life God has called us to live in Christ is right now, today. But those things are only possible if we love other people as we should. Christian growth is not possible if we're trying to do it without the love of Christ and without the goal of loving as Christ loves us. So today, Paul's gonna to speak about the critical needs for the days before Christ's return. He said, and do this or live a life controlled by love as the law. This is our new law. Understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. There's so much in this. Paul uh, is going to talk about the last days, the end times. 
Eschatology is the theological word that means the study of the end times. There's a brief history to that and you, it needs to be considered in order to really understand what Paul is saying here. Paul was in the first century and when he wrote this letter from Corinth, things in Rome had not become as rough as they were about to. It really was from the end of the first century to 313 AD, Rome became a very difficult place for Christians to exist and survive. Uh, it's an interesting study, and if you'll read uh, some of Melissa's history at the beginning, it might help. But in three, it was 313 AD when Constantine became emperor. It was then that he legalized the church. Up, be, up until that time, it was considered in opposition to the Roman government. But in 313, it became legal within the Roman government to be a Christian. He was the first Roman emperor that was really sympathetic toward Christianity, largely because his mother was. It is fascinating to go to Jerusalem and go to the church there within the walls of the old city. And you can visit the church that Constantine's mother wanted built. And to be in that place and realize what a huge moment that was in the city of Jerusalem to have a church, Christian church built. So we moms have more influence than we realize. The early church fathers were mostly all premillennial. What does that mean? That means that they believed Jesus Christ would return to the world and that there would be a thousand year period of time when the rest of the world would have a choice of whether to accept Jesus or not. And it is that millennial time that is described. Uh, some believe it to be a literal thousand years. Others believe it's symbolic. That would be the amillennials. Amillennials believed that this thousand year period was just another period of history. And amillennial means that they didn't believe in the thousand year tribulation that the premillennials did. Amillennials just referred to that as the time when the world would be turning. And there's a lot of scripture that would support that in terms of the last days were really ushered in at the new covenant, when the new covenant was at the death of Christ. And then you also have post-millennial, which is that the thousand year tribulation after Jesus's return. So we've got three premillennial, which I might've said that wrong earlier. Premillennial is the thousand years of tribulation before Christ's return. Amillennial doesn't really think there's a thousand year tribulation. It's just a period of time when Christ is going to return. And the postmillennial, which is the thousand year, which Jesus returns and the thousand years occurs after that. And if I sound confused, it's because I kind of am. I put myself in the category of being pro-millennial. I am for whatever God chooses to do during the last days. Or I'm pan-millennial, which means I believe with all my heart, things are gonna pan out in the end. I really don't know and don't even attempt to know or determine what is going to happen in the last days because Jesus said, nobody knows. Jesus said, it's not for us to know. And so while there are thousands and thousands of volumes that have been written on the subject of the last times, there's never been a book that could honestly say, I figured it out and this is it. And if there is one of those books, 
go ahead and use it as decor on your shelf to set something on because it's not right. There is no certain knowledge we have of what Jesus is going to do. Jesus didn't even know. It's almost to me heresy to predict the end times. Jesus said, we're not going to know. We're not going to know. And so I've never invested a lot of my own thinking in that. Here's what I do know. Paul gets it exactly right. His theology of the end times from the book of Romans is where I plant myself. Basically, Paul wrote, our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. We can know that for certain. You are one day closer to heaven right now than you were yesterday. 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5 says, But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lover of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. That passage has been read and taught and used as an indicator throughout history that when a culture grew weak, it must mean Jesus is going to return. But I would say in every century since Paul wrote those words, there was some city in some nation somewhere that could have defined their culture in that way. When Paul wrote, but understand that in the last days, he was referring to the time that was post-Messiah. Almost always in scripture, when you read the phrase, the last days, that's what is being intended from the prophets. They described the last days as the time after Messiah. When Paul wrote these words, he absolutely believed that Jesus would return soon. All of the early authors, uh, all of the apostles thought Jesus would return soon. And certainly when the persecution that took place of the Christians in Rome, they were sent to the Colosseum, they were killed and burned on stakes. During all of the history since Paul wrote this letter, there have been times like that and cultures that this described. If we're to be perfectly honest, it's a little unnerving to consider how closely Paul's description describes our own American culture as we see it today. It is an interesting thought, but I want all of us to realize that one of the times in American culture when everyone believed the return of Christ was imminent was after the world wars, after they had seen all that, after the Great Depression, when church attendance just diminished, when people grew far more interested. Picture the Roaring Twenties and the renegade laws, the reason they had to abolish alcohol. Uh, the government tried to control behavior that was getting out of control. The government's always tried to legislate morality and they've never succeeded. Only God can do that. 
But we can know this, what we know for certain, we are one day closer to the return of Christ. In Matthew 24, 12, it said that because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Jesus said that to his apostles. He said lawlessness would increase, and he said the love of many, meaning the love of people for God, would grow cold. And then in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, John said, children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. John was certain that Jesus was going to return. But he, the truth is no less there because Jesus didn't come quickly after John wrote those words. There have always been antichrists in the world. And if I watch my TV today and the fall lineup or the, the lineup for the next year's schedule, I've been amazed at the increase in what I call the dark subjects, the occult subjects that Hollywood seems to be fascinated with today. Even Hollywood's fascination with science fiction and fantasy seems to be increasing. Isn't that a sign that antichrists are at work? That simply means a subject, a teaching, a way of thinking that is anti-Christ's way of thinking or teaching. That's what that phrase means. Something or someone is antichrist when they stand against what Christ would stand for. And yes, it's the last hour. If not for the world, maybe it's the last hour in our lives. Paul continues when he says, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. You know, the older I get, the more interested in heaven I become. It's logical. I actually am old enough to know that most of my life has been lived and less of my life is in front of me. In fact, we're probably looking at two thirds <laughs> if you wanna be really truthful. The night is nearly over. That's a plus for me. I don't fear aging. I don't like the aches and the pains, but sometimes I think that's God's way of setting our hearts on things above. The night is nearly over. This life is the night. It's dark. We see through the glass darkly now, but it's almost over. The day is almost here. So what do we do while we wait? What do we do while we wait for Jesus to come back and get us or Jesus to come back and get everyone? We put aside the deeds of darkness and instead we put on the armor of light. That is a suggestion, a claim, an encouragement, and maybe even a command for the rest of our days. Take the things that belong to this world and set them aside. They're dark. And don't you sense the increase in the darkness in our world? Set it aside, move away from it. Don't allow it in your home. Watch those computer screens and keep the darkness out of your life. Set it aside. Don't allow those movies to increase the darkness in your thoughts and in your life. Instead, 
put on the armor of light. It's discussed in Ephesians chapter 6, and that's what Paul's referring to today. But he was also referring to the Roman armor that they knew so well in this first century Roman church. They saw these soldiers every single day. And the, the rule was that these soldiers polish their armor and wear it. And when the sun hit it, it was blinding. And Paul uses that as an illustration to put on, wear on the outside, this armor of light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He then told his disciples, you're the light of the world. And Paul is saying, put it on. You are the light. And the picture here is taking off night clothes, bed clothes, uh, something you would sleep in to put on the dress for the day, the dress to go to work, the dress to accomplish things and get things done. He's calling that the armor of light. Remember when Paul wrote this letter, he wrote it from the city of Corinth. And he was in a city that had the greatest struggle to set aside their Greek way of thinking. The Gentiles in Corinth, let's just say they were more Gentile than most. And they struggled to separate from their old life that had some really sinful aspects to it. And to separate from that and to live for Christ was a huge transition. Corinth had a Sodom and Gomorrah type character. And Paul probably didn't have to look very far to define what he's trying to teach Rome right now. He didn't have to go much farther than to look outside his window. Corinth doesn't really exist very much anymore. As an ancient city, there's not a lot to see of the antiquities. On the other hand, Ephesus was a city very similar to Corinth, and it existed at the same time. The remains, the antiquities in Ephesus were preserved for years and centuries under the dirt, and therefore were more protected than most other ancient cities. And so I've included two pictures for you to see that give you an idea of the culture of these cities that Paul spoke to. It was very much the culture that extended to Rome. In Ephesus, it's where the Romans vacationed. It's, it was a city on the sea that would be like going to the Hamptons or a fancy city or in, on the ocean. The very wealthy at homes there. What you're looking at in the picture of the tall building is the library in Ephesus, known for housing thousands of ancient documents. It's also known for being the secret entrance to a hidden tunnel that they found not too long ago that went from the library all the way to the temple of Artemis, where men would engage in what was defined as temple worship with the priestesses there, which was quite literally sexual relationships with women in that temple. That's the library. It looked really good on the outside. It looked like those who entered the building were there for admirable purposes. And so often it was used for the opposite. Then you look at the Colosseum that's been preserved in Ephesus, and you can see how huge that is. I've been there many times. Notice at the very bottom of the picture, the height of the wall. In an ancient antiquity, when you look at a Colosseum, when the wall extends up that tall, that meant that that particular Colosseum was used for the gladiator games, where so often Christians were literally fed to lions. That is 
the culture of the first century. They would go there to listen to great speaking. They would go there to watch plays. They would go there to watch Christians be killed. That was the culture that Paul is writing to. So Paul's point was quite literal to the first century. Wake up, live now. We have no idea what's coming, but there were already indicators. So Paul's point was to live every moment as a person who lives in the light, a person whose actions can stand, withstand the light of day, who function like they're awake, like they're ready to go, ready to work. And he writes in chapter 13, verse 13, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. He said, don't act like the culture because everything that I just listed was considered quite normal and quite acceptable in the Roman culture. Paul says, wake up, throw off that kind of culture, that kind of behavior. Live like you're there to work for God in the armor of God. He's not just addressing the sins of the Gentiles. He's also addressing Jewish Christians who needed to throw off their air of superiority, their confidence in areas of their faith that they should not have been confident in. The appearance of good when it didn't go past the surface. Paul's saying, throw it all off. I've taught you all this. Now it's time now to get rid of it. He says, rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Put on, clothe yourself with the character of Jesus. Let that be what people see when they see you. Remember, the desires of the flesh are any behaviors or inclinations that are motivated by your human nature, not the divine motivation or understanding that we have through His Spirit. Paul says we should wear Jesus on the outside because we're thinking constantly of ways that we can please Him. What does all of this have to do with hope? Consider what Paul's already said. In Romans 5, 2 through 5, he wrote, Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces Endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given us. Remember back in chapter five when we talked about the description of Christian character that Paul has given. Your hope in putting on Jesus, being clothed with Jesus, that is our hope that his character will clothe us during our lives, throughout our days. It's our hope that no matter what happens in this world, we will live eternally with him when he returns. Colossians 1.27 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in us, the promises of Christ, that is our hope 
and it's a hope we're called to share with the world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18, Paul said, so we do not lose heart. I wanna say that again to all of you Christians today who feel like things aren't going as well. We don't lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Let me sum up this passage this way. Some of my favorite people to be in the presence of here on earth are those that are the closest to their eternity. They may be facing a difficult diagnosis, but they're facing it with faith. They may be facing another birthday knowing it most certainly could be their last. But they face it with joy because the strongest, most powerful Christians I know are these quiet elderly who have lived with the hope of Christ for so long in their life. He's as real to them as the chair they're sitting on. And I love to be with them because they remind me that what I believe is true. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Our hope of eternity is guaranteed by scripture. It's guaranteed by the presence of God's Holy Spirit within us. It's guaranteed because of God's grace, not our ability to have perfect obedience. Titus 3, 7 says, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You are not just a child of God when you arrive in heaven. You are his child right now. You will not just inherit God's blessings one day. You inherit them now. You own them now. They are possibly, some of them stored for you as treasure in heaven, but a lot of his blessings are yours right now. When will Jesus return? When God tells him to. Not when people think in fact, the Bible says he'll come at an hour when we think not. We have lots of signs that could indicate these are last days. We have no proof until we see Jesus. That's when we'll know. So he'll either return at the end of time for you or he'll return at the end of your time on earth. Either way, one day you will close your eyes here and the next blink you'll see him. Until then, we're called to live as children of the light right now. Don't delay, don't put off stepping up to live the high standards. Don't put off enjoying the hope we have until you can see Jesus face to face. He is here. He's within you. Enjoy your blessings now. Enjoy your dad now. Live as a child of the light now. William Barclay said, for the Christian, heaven is where Jesus is. We do not need to speculate on what heaven will be like. It's enough to know that we will be forever with him. That's our hope. And it's our hope right now. 
I'll see you next time.